Why don't we uh, <clears throat> let's come together? Why don't we share together now as a, a whole group? <clears throat> It'd be helpful to me. Is that what you, is that what you say when you all gather? You say. Okay. Well, I would love to hear a little bit more now. Of we've been through a lot of stuff this morning. What has gotten stimulated in your own heart? What questions might be arising in you? Uh, I know you'll have more time this afternoon to, to process this, but uh, I'd love to process a little bit each day with you. I'm even asking Graham if he would come and share with us a little bit of what he got out of the Book of Esther. I asked him last night uh, uh, just before going to sleep, so he hasn't had a lot of time to even think. but. Graham, why don't you come and share just a little bit, by way of illustration, just for all of us to keep sharing what is God saying to us really helps the word come alive in us. So, Graham, uh, share with us. Hello. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, so I didn't really prepare for this because I, I want to process this with you. Like, I kind of want to go through what you just did, just kind of in front of you. Um, the th so after reading through this, you know, several times, one of the big themes to me is about beauty. It talks about beauty in so many ways. In the queens, it's the palace, it's how things were decorated, it's the feast. There's, there's such beauty in there. And it, even in, even here where Bruce separates the story from where it's leading up to until it reverses, the first half has so much to do with an outer beauty, outer qualities of beauty. And the second half is inner qualities of beauty. So I'm asking how, how do, how do, what does God do with beauty, right? And so, and this is relevant to me because actually, Several years ago, I was in this very same classroom as a staff member, and, th and I met my wife here. And so, not in our classroom, don't do that. So, uh, like Andrew, so we both married beautiful Korean women. And we have, yeah, we have firstborn sons that are handsome, right? So I'm like, you know, what, I need to know what to do with this. And, uh, and so, so this is on my heart, this, this question about beauty, right? And let's see. So I'll begin with, let's look at, like, let's look at how, how the king uses beauty. What does he do with beauty, right? He brings Vashti in after he's drunk in a festival, and he wants her to show herself, to show her beauty off, right? So this, this is what man will do with beauty. And now, like, look at what God will do with beauty, okay? He, he sees, so man sees the outer beauty first, right? We know this. God sees the inner beauty first, right? And he, he pulls, he pulls both Esther and he pulls, let's see. So he, yeah, he pulls both Esther and Mordecai in chapter 2. Look at, pull, go to chapter 2, like the very beginning, and look at where they come from. So you see a list of Mordecai's sons, right? Now, that ties into the end of Jeremiah, which you guys have already read. 
And the end of Jeremiah talks about King Nebuchadnezzar and what he did with Jerusalem and then who he brought out of Jerusalem. And so Mordecai is a descendant on this line. Mordecai is Esther's, what, uncle or parental guardian because Esther's parents are dead. So look at where they've come from. And then you can see how God uses the beauty of Esther, right? To actually prove her inner beauty later. And the same with Mordecai. And so the second half of the book, you have this, this great theme of who are these people inside. It's, it's them being proven. It's that inner beauty, those qualities being proven through circumstance. And so then that kind of the question then that I, I came with is like, do I always recognize, am I, you know, I can recognize beauty on the outside, but can I so easily recognize the beauty on the inside? Like the way that God is so carefully bringing me through something to prove that inner beauty. And so I think that, that kind of that kind of wraps up, I think, where I was going with it. And so that's just, that's just kind of how, so beauty stood out, and then that, that's kind of me just processing that out with you guys about what I've read from this book, and then how that applies, right? And so I think how that applies is that I've even already started a letter to my son when he's older that, that how do you, how do you steward these gifts that God has given, right? Yeah. Not, only, not only exterior beauty, but inner beauty. Wow. So. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks, man. So that's a great illustration of how something begins to speak to you out of a story like this and how you can process it and move it into what does it mean in me and my context like Graham and his family, and how will I apply it, okay? Graham does a great job of this. I've been so blessed over the days with how he processes scripture. So I'm very glad I'm gonna draw, I hopefully draw him every day here to share with you a little bit. But what are some of the things now that have arisen in your heart? What are things that are speaking to you out of this morning? could be in anything. One thing that stood out to me was that Esther had tremendous courage and bravery to go before a king uh, so that the Jews could be saved. And that Jesus went before the king of kings, the God creator of heavens and earth, so we all can be saved. So I see this huge parallel between the character of Esther and the character of Jesus. That if, if Esther didn't go before King Xerxes, the Jews would have been annihilated by, right. by physical death. That's right. If Jesus didn't go before God, we would have been annihilated by spiritual death. Yes. And I think that's pretty cool. Oh, that's a great illustration. Great illustration. There's a lot of redemptive revelation in this story that, that relates to that bigger story, uh, like, like what was just shared. Jesus standing before the authorities for truth resulted in his sacrifice. Unlike Esther, <laughs> but it has the same redemptive purpose to it, isn't it? It's great. Okay, anybody else? Yes. I see this. Um, this intense level of patience that's needed if you see the book of Esther. Um, just even regards to seeing God's perfect timing, his perfect scenario to take place, there had to be a level of patience, like Mordecai saved the king, but he was forgotten. A level of patience that was needed because mm -hmm. the perfect scenario was to see Haman come and want that prize that was given to the, um, Mordecai instead. Later on when um, uh, with with, with um, the banquet, you know, the feast with Queen Esther, the, the level of patience of waiting for that moment to execute the plan, of, and then boom, right there, she spills it, the king is furious, leaves, and then 
Haman's freaking out and then somehow trips over and looks like he's on top of Queen Esther and then right then happens to be that the king comes back and he's like, wow, like how dare you? And I see the perfect plan in that is that a good scenario would be that the Jews were protected, but a better scenario is that not only were they protected, but the evil one, Haman, was also destroyed. You know what I mean? And, and if it was a little sooner or, or a little premature, maybe Haman wouldn't have received that punishment. But because of that perfect scenario that took in place with the level of patience, we see that God's like, I want to give you the best scenario. Just wait and wait, you know? Yes, yes. That's great. That's great. Another thing that I whoa, another thing that I saw was that God knows those who are His, wow. and He plans on glorifying Himself through them. And um, a question that I had was, I wonder how Esther took the death of her, of her family, like her mom and her dad. Like, would her life be different if they were still alive? Wow. And I'm curious how Mordecai raised her. If he like, did he have sisters? Like, how did he know how to raise? this like he was entrusted he was a steward of her life and then he becomes a steward of a ki- in the king's in the kingdom and i just want to know like because my brain constantly goes to jesus to like how are you raised what were your human moments like home videos like i can't wait to get to heaven and look at how you were raised because we don't have a clue and uh, when he was 12 and and so i'm curious how esther was raised and like how he ingrained those principles and how he helped her view maybe the death of her family and like how, how he raised this incredible woman. Like, yeah. Those are good questions. Those kinds of questions, see, often are things that you are pregnant with that are unanswered in you. And sometimes you just have to keep holding on to them and ponder it. Because there might come a time where God is going to really give you answer to something. Now, in this story, maybe we don't find answer. But the very question that has arisen in you about this, I don't doubt that God will someday give you amazing answer to it. That's a great question. You know, it's personally it's said to me, this both of these two questions here, and the sovereign way that God is orchestrating things just at the right time, and he does it without even explaining how he's doing it, but it just happens, gives me great confidence that God is watching over us. And no matter what the circumstances, if we, will, if we will wait patiently, trust, walk with integrity, God can or- orchestrate things and bring about things that we can never do on our own. In the midst of all the turmoil that we face, you know, even on our campus, you, you deal with all kinds of people and situations. Sometimes you just can get overblown with all the problems and issues and stuff that just constantly are there, you know. But we have to trust that God in the midst of this, he's with us. He's watching over us, and he will bring about fulfillment at the right time. If we're willing to be courageous, walk patiently, truthfully, and so forth. I also see in Mordecai almost an illustration of a father watching over a daughter, just like a husband and wife relationship or a father-son-daughter relationship. And it, it's almost as if this, has a, this fits the larger story also of the father watching over his children. And he will protect and guard and keep just like Mordecai did in the story. Or a husband in relationship to a wife, a bride. God's speaking to you, isn't he?
ponder those deep questions that come up in your heart when you reflect on these things. Because it's in the midst of those questions that God will plant an answer at the right time that can transform your life for a lifetime. Yes. Other things come to heart and mind? Yes. Um, it kind of goes without w what you started to say about the person of Mordecai. I was really impressed by him, just yeah. who he is, and especially his humble way and his just his goodness, how he acted out, and his just being himself actually brought him so much favor, actually, that he got, at the end, blessed so much by the king. It's amazing. And just the contrast to Haman, that like Haman was not a good guy, but he had actually higher precision as, as Mordecai. But at the end, like Mordecai got so much more blessed, so much more favor than Haman. And I don't know, this just stood out to me that I don't know, the goodness gets kind of a favor. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes when God has put us in a place and others seemingly get all the glory, rule over you, seemingly go uh, and can just kind of do whatever they want. And you feel very sometimes squashed or neglected or overruled or whatever. Like Mordecai, when he stood, when the day came, when he was given honor, I think he had already learned how to trust God when it wasn't there. When he was being looked down on. There's something of a real uh, inner strength that comes that God can only give us when we're in weakness and trusting in the midst of corruption that enables us then, when blessing comes, not to become attached to it. Because if we come too attached to that honor and that blessing, we can be led by it instead of trusting the Lord in the midst of it. And it's a hard lesson, very hard lesson. But I think that, that's something, I think, what you're highlighting with Mordecai, isn't it? He learned something when he was being despised that he held on to, that when he was honored, he could steward in a right way. Yeah. Haman, Haman illustrates honor and authority in a corrupt heart and what he does with it. Yeah. And it's interesting why he gets so angry when he comes to Mordecai and Mordecai does not bow down to him. That shows you somebody that's attached to his own honor and he must have other people reflect it to him because it's his life and so he corrupts his stewardship of it whereas later Mordecai entrusted with great honor and how he stewards that to save others instead of saving himself yeah. okay other things just anything this morning. Is there anything earlier uh, that you might even be on to Esther that feel free to share as well? Yes. Okay, so mine's still on Esther. Uh -huh. I want to go back to the scene of when she approaches the king. Uh -huh. um, in our group, we just kind of discuss, like, there's some times where we need to step out first, and then the Lord will come. Uh -huh. And it's in times of taking risk first when you don't know the outcome, right? She didn't know if the king would have extended 
his sword or if she would have been killed. Yes. And sometimes it's that time of, okay, did I hear the Lord? Did I not hear the Lord? But it's walking in that, that faithfulness of the Lord and the obedience of God that he will come through. He will yes. save Esther. And through her obedience, she saved an entire people group. Yes. And it's that one choice that she had. Like, what if she wouldn't have done that? the repercussion but because of her obedience because she said yes to the lord and stepped out in that risk what unfolded from that yeah. and it's just that simple obedience that point. does shift history yep. so that stood out yep. to our group yep. that's great Um, for me, uh, the Queen Peshiti, yeah, she kind of stood up uh, in chapter one and through two, and then um, because she refused to uh, King's calling, she was banished, and then like even just one like a King's calling, like he, they made her like ban be banished, and then how I respond to his calling. Like God's calling, even simple, just like it's a simple, like calling. It's not like crazy, like saving like people, but then in daily life, like simple calling. What He asks me to do and to be, like what is that? Like and then if I'm walking in obedience, like uh, in His calling, and then uh, in verse 18, like people, the uh, advisor said, like before this day is out, like the wives, all of the king's nobles throughout Persia and the media will hear what the queen did and we start treating their husbands the same way. There will be no end to their contempt and anger. And then it shows like a leadership, like because we have a way of values and 12, do first and teach. And then the queen showed her leadership, like she has a responsibility to show that because I'm gonna, I'm the one who leads people, especially like wives. And then she didn't like walk in like obedience, and she didn't do what she was supposed to do. So that that how like leads people into like a really bad, like, yeah. yeah stuff. And then I think it, for me it is really important to see that like if I walk in obedience, and then if I I'm ready to lead people into like a good reaction and response to God. So it was really, to me like. A, yeah, standing out. Yeah, great, great. See, in these situations, right in your own context, it might be that God is prompting in your heart something very, very specific that you need to stand up and face. And you might fear the consequences. <coughs> But this kind of thing, when we ponder a story like this, and when God moves in your heart, like you're saying, to step out and just, by faith, obey and see what happens. This is what God loves to, to work with. And uh, he can, he can, he can greatly save in the midst of the consequences of your obedience. Okay, yes. For me, um, kind of the theme of the first part of Esther was how to become that bride, because King, you know, all, always represents Jesus for me, and his brides and queens are us. And I was like, oh, like how, and it was just interesting to see that um, how Hadessa or Esther was already in the fortress of Susa. She was in the proximity of Susa. So when they threw that party for from the greatest to the least, she was probably at the party observing what the king's taste is, what the king looks in a girl. So he was, she, Esther and Mordecai was able to prepare Esther into that taste that king likes. And um, when king tells, Haggai, he tells Haggai to prepare the woman into harem, and Haggai was also at harem. So uh, also at the fortress of Susa. So when Esther was chosen, he probably knew Esther before she was even chosen. And you could see that because she was so proximate to the king's kingdom, she had extra favor. She was, she was given special menu and special treatment from the eunuch who was preparing these wives. 
So just like being part of that presence, being in the presence of the king whenever you can, gives you that favor over all the other women who are coming from far. And I was just reading how um, when um, when Vashiti when Vashiti or whatever her name is when she when she died or when she was sent away it was the third year of king's reign and when Esther was presented to the king it was the seventh year which means two four years have passed and it said the woman had to be prepared for a year which leaves three years and there was 120 some women and king could call them again to his presence by name which means Esther was probably at the end of the line, which would have sticked in the king's memory. So it's just like, and also um, when they declare the decree of like, oh, every woman should follow what the men says in that family, that was probably the strictest in the fortress of Haram. And her just being in that proximity of king allowed her to be prepared to what the king wanted in a woman just like spoke to me as in like, you gotta be close to God, you gotta be close to Jesus in order for you to be prepared into that bride that Jesus is seeking in. Wow, yeah, great. It's just awesome. Oh, you guys are processing so good. <laughs> this is great, this is good. Well, I'm almost ready to release you. Uh, ponder this further this afternoon. Let's really get some specific thing from Esther to really get planted in your heart that you take hold of, okay? And then <clears throat> tomorrow we will get into Ezra and Haggai. Haggai is only two chapters. It's one of the best prophets I've ever read. So we'll get into those two books tomorrow, okay? And. Uh, Let's just keep working. You guys are doing well. You're doing your homework, so I'm very encouraged. And uh, let me uh, pray as we close, and we'll, we'll carry on. Father, how we just thank you for your word and the amazing revelation that you give us. Lord, we just thank you for these days that together in this place we can ponder these things. And Lord, how I pray that your spirit will take something very, very specific and plant your word in us in these days in ways that we will never forget. That we might live out and that we might follow all that you are willing to do to fulfill your story among us in this generation. Lord, continue to speak to us as we get into these books. May we understand all that you want to say to us. Help us, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good.